Good evening. How are you feeling this evening? Are we good? Yes. 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 <laughs> okay. So I'm going to kick it off. You know, one of my favorite lines all, of all time, actually, is a Steven Tyler line. Steven Tyler, obviously, of Aerosmith. One of the songs called Amazing has a lyric that says, life's a journey, not a destination. Speaking of life's journey, I've had the privilege of spending around three decades and then some in the business of entertainment, in the business of experiential, in the business of music and radio, and in the process had the privilege of meeting very many special people. People who have spent a life of determination, of grit, of vision, perseverance, to achieve what they've set out to. In fact, this evening, I have with me two such very, very special people. We feature them on what we call Tell Us Like It Is. The first is a lady of grit, of determination, of extreme beauty, both in and out. She won the Miss India and the Miss Universe contest back in 2000, and then went on to much, much greater things. And we'll get to know a little bit more about her and all she's achieved. And of course, the gentleman won his first Grand Slam in tennis back in 97, the mixed doubles, and has gone on to win 12 Grand Slam titles. In fact, eight in the mixed and four in the men's doubles, and that's only the beginning of his story. I'm extremely privileged, like I said, to have them with me today. Welcome to an episode that is so special, an episode of Tell Us Like It Is. Please join me in welcoming a couple of people who I have the privilege of calling friends. Let's welcome Lara Datta Bhupati and Mahesh Bhupati. Well, good evening. Firstly, welcome to Tell Us Like It Is, and good thank evening. you so very much. It truly is a privilege to have you guys here uh, on Tell Us Like It Is, which is a show, an episode, in which we chat with people like you and figure out what helped you all become the people you all are. I'm going to cut to the chase and, you know, cut to the present. Happily married, pretty evidently. <laughs> How do you Very really happy. Mahesh, is <laughs> Mahesh is saving his comments. Yeah? Yeah, he's not debating it, Lara. He's not debating it. He better not. <laughs> <laughs> Happily married. <laughs> no, so how did you guys meet? So firstly, Brian, thank you for having us. Oh, you're, you're welcome. Very kind with your introductions. Privilege. And just want to say good evening and thank you for being here. I was wondering, um, driving into town on a Friday evening, I was honestly wondering who wanted to spend their Friday evening listen to Mahesh and me talk. The so audience I'm... goes way beyond just the live <laughs> audience, I promise you. <laughs> but thank you so much. Um, I'm actually, I would have to say I'm humbled, honestly, to see all of you guys here. Uh, happily, yes. Mm, it's a work in progress, like every marriage is, every single day. But uh, we kind of, we're going to be coming up to nine years in February. Yep. And uh, we found few things that we've kind of cracked to make it work. <laughs> we still throw brick bats, or at least I still throw things at him <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> and the reaction being? Uh, he's a very catch. good at ducking. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cricketer's forte, <laughs> but then again, multi-talented, multi-faceted. Yeah, yeah. So happily married, I mean, nine years? Nine years. And I'm sure some, you know, some fantastic stories uh, over the last nine, including that beautiful, beautiful daughter of yours, yep. Sarah, whom we will speak about, uh, you know, as the show progresses. How did you all meet? Oh. I want to hear Mahesh's version, huh? Because okay. I'm okay. normally okay. the one who tells this story. And so just now. by the way, you're all allowed. You're all allowed to love each other, to fight, <laughs> to do whatever you want, right? Please feel free. Go on, Mahesh. We uh, met randomly. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I have a talent management firm that uh, used to manage Lara, 
and uh, I was never, you know, I was always traveling playing tennis, so I never really got to meet any of my clients, but there was a transition in the company, so uh, one day I told my team that I'd like to start meeting my clients. Uh, that's my side of the story. <laughs> we met one client. One. Yeah. One client we met. <laughs> and, then, and then, of course, refused to meet anyone else. Hey, you know what? Yeah, because firstly, his whole idea of meeting clients was very strange because I was obviously told, you know, so I knew that Mahesh Bhupati owned Global Sport. You know, they handled sport and film personalities. I was with them for three years. They handled all my endorsements and appearances and things like that but never set my eyes on Mahesh Bhupati ever, right? And to be very honest, um, the only tennis that I actually ever watched was only if Sampras and Agassi were playing. So I knew obviously who Leander Pays and Mahesh Bhupati were. I mean, I knew exactly who the Indian Express was, but to be very honest, never followed their careers. I was very happy when they won and things like that, like any Indian would be, but you know, that was it. Um, and then I'm told that, you know, so Mahesh wants to meet the clients that he's now handling and whatever. And I said, fine. So can we pass your number on? I said, sure. And then I got a text message from firstly, when you don't know someone's name in your phone, you know, when they send you a message, like whatever they've stored their name as kind of comes up, but you only see it like before you open the message. So you only see whatever that is. And then when you open the message, it's only a number, right? So it said, Big Daddy, firstly. <laughs> Then I open the message and it says, hey, Lara, this is Mahesh, da 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 you know, and you know that I want to meet, da 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 So uh, how about a drink on whatever? I was like, a drink? <laughs> no. How about coffee in a public coffee shop at 5 o'clock in the evening? <laughs> and then that was our official first meeting. Now we'll go on to your version. <laughs> <laughs> that was it, Amayesh. Huh, that was it. Oh, great. That was it. He was very upset because obviously I showed up in all my star power, finished the meeting, call my driver, Mercedes drives up, Mahesh says yes, yes, opens the door very nicely, gets in, and then he calls a hired taxi to go back. <laughs> Welcome to reality. So. <laughs> this is the real world, Lara. This is the real world. That's fantastic. I think that's fantastic that you can, you know, a great start, and, and they lived happily ever after. Of course. <laughs> you know, and that's the beautiful thing. Yeah. I want to roll back actually a little bit and get to know a little bit more Mahesh. Now, you know, we're talking global sport, we're talking a whole load of other things that you're doing, IPTL, you know, and uh, the other business ventures that you have. Tell us a little bit about what's happening with you now. And we'll roll back the years later. Right now, uh, obviously retired from tennis, so that's kind of changed a lot uh, of my lifestyle. I used to travel 35 weeks a year, now I'm uh, I'm not even traveling 35 days a year, so it's a big change for me, but I'm kind of adjusted to it. Obviously, Saira being at home um, has also kind of helped that because, I mean, now sure. she's grown to an age where, you know, she's going to school, she's doing a lot of activities, playing a little tennis. Uh, but yeah, I mean, a few business ventures mainly related to the celebrity world, and uh, we're doing a lot of licensing today. Uh, yeah, it's different, but uh, yeah, enjoying it. Lara, how about you? I mean, there's a brand new business venture. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> so for me, I think, um, Ryan, I've never actually conformed to any sort of one career path in my life. And I think that kind of, for me, has always been somebody that I... Like, just the person that I've been from the time I was a child. So even when growing up, if I was one of those, you know, kids whose parents said, oh, tell them what do you want to be. And then I never kind of wanted to be just the engineer or the doctor or the actor or whatever. I, at any given point of time, always wanted to be at least three careers at the same time. And none of them had anything to do with each other, you know. So I wanted to be an astronaut, a ballerina, and an archaeologist. Um, and I think for me in life, I've kind of always also just lived that kind of path. So I did, when I mean, I started modeling when I was 16 years old. Uh, of course, did Miss India and Miss Universe came very natural, the transition was to come into Bollywood. Um, but then from there, being a producer, now being an entrepreneur, it's just a lifetime of experience. I've spent 25 years in the business. And for me, you know, just now we've launched Arise Skincare just in right. April this year. And it came from a space of saying, you know, I've been here for 25 years. I've been in the industry, I've had um, access to the best makeup artists and skin experts world over, but I've never really found anything that's really worked for Indian skin. And I'm 41 years old this year, 
and uh, 41 years young. <laughs> young. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and I found that as I got older, especially with Indian skin, you know, your, your requirements change. Indian skin ages very differently. So though today we have every single multinational brand in the country available to us, we still don't have one skincare brand that takes care of everything end to end and therefore the birth of Arias and, you know, right. creating it over two years. So yeah, entrepreneur. I'm intrigued with the name. Uh, is it what I suspect it yeah, is? Of course it is. <laughs> uh, okay, there you go. So it's Syrah spelled, spelled backwards. backwards. Yeah. 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 And hey, more power. You know, what? when one looks at both of you and, you know, kind of dwells on this fantastic journey, professional and personal, it obviously comes from somewhere deep within the value systems. And I'm very, very keen to know about a little bit about the growing up years. Mahesh, I'm going to come to you. Man, I've, I've seen you play at the highest level, had the privilege of watching you play in doubles. Grit, determination, perseverance, all the adjectives I used a little earlier in such large doses. I'm sure it comes from somewhere. Take us back in time to the early years, you know, a little bit of a story. Of the, you know, what's, what's gone into making Mahesh Bhupiti the man he is today? I don't know how to, how to answer that. I mean, my dad put me into tennis very young, and I think things have evolved to a certain stage where uh, I don't know if tennis was my first choice, but it became my automatic choice, and then it, I got to loving it enough that I really wanted to pursue it. I think my dad took me to Wimbledon, I think, in, 90, in 1987 when I was 13, and obviously being there, you know, got the juices flowing to the point where you wanted to kind of play there at some point in your life as well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, playing tennis is glamorous when you talk about, uh, or you sit back and talk about whatever you've won today, but you know, it's, it's possibly the most lonely sport out there because it's an individual sport, it's not a team event. I probably spent 25 years of my life traveling alone. I went to Play. I went to the Harry Hopman Academy when I was seven, unaccompanied. My parents wow. sent me on a plane. So, you know, I spent most of my life alone in hotel rooms. So, uh, life now is totally different. I mean, my wife's kind of, you know, taken over my social calendar, introduced me to people. <laughs> I have friends that I can, you know, <laughs> with all that didn't exist before. I mean, my only circle was my tennis circle. And any friends that I have used to play tennis, never made it, and today are in the business world. So... Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of sacrifice, but, you know, if you look back now, I guess everything's worth it. So, you know, there's this often spoken about nuance that says there are tons of tennis players that are talented almost equally, give or take, but matches or slams or tournaments are won in the mind, and that really makes the difference between a winner and someone who doesn't win that often. A little bit about that, about mental get-up, what it takes. I think the head is a very important component. I think, uh, yeah, today hard work, everyone's putting in the same That's amount right. of work. Most people can hit a great backhand and a forehand, but unless you can win the points when it counts, that's what stands out. And, you know, Djokovic, Rafa and Roger are a perfect example. Guys can play them close every match, but when it comes to the crunch, they take it up a notch. And that's... I think that's where tennis makes a difference. It's the heart, the head, and the legs. If you don't have all three components, you won't make it. You seem a very controlled person, at least socially, right? <laughs> you, you, you save the lines, and I've had the privilege of hearing the lines, <laughs> albeit in private conversation. You know, when you're out there on the court, you're out there on the court. I mean, you know, does it take a big switch? You know, from, you know, being the person you are that's controlled, that's, Reserved, if I might, and when you're out there, your, your aggression levels, uh, your desire to win. We've seen tennis players of all kinds, some like the Boggs and, you know, maybe yeah. even the Federers of this world are very controlled. And on the other hand, you've got really aggressive players. What does it take? I mean, you know, is it, is it a pull and push, personal personality versus the tennis champion? Uh, yeah, I think on the court is different. I mean, for me specifically, because we play doubles, so I always had to feed off my partner and the energy coming on from, you know, the other side of the court. And, uh, you know, there are days when I'm playing terrible and my partner has to you right. know, get the energy going and vice versa. So, um, and I kind of thrive in team competition as well. I went to college in the States and that also kind of gave me a sense into how team competition works. So, it... it uh, 
Yeah, I mean, energy on the court, most of the time people couldn't understand it when they knew me off court, how that would translate to the energy they saw on the court, but it kind of stayed on the court most of the time. <laughs> exactly the reason for my asking. Lara doesn't look like she agrees with you completely on that last bit. <laughs> we'll come to you, Lara. I mean, you know, I can clearly remember that, that day in 2000, uh, the Miss India win. I was, you know, one of the privileged few to be around at that time. Uh, doing my little voice of God announcements uh, <laughs> around the venue. And, and you went on, that was a great year for India. Yes. Uh, all three of you all went on to, uh, to create huge, huge, beautiful careers. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the journey up until then. So, uh, Brian, honestly for me, I, and I am going to start a way little back, so bear with me. Yeah, um, please do. So my dad is um, a byproduct of the partition, right? Right. So born in what is current day, you know, Karachi, um, was living in what is present day Pakistan and was about seven years old when the partition happened and was one of the, you know, people or the families that had to leave with the clothes on their back and then walk across the border, leaving everything that they had, ancestral property, the home that they knew, literally everything. I mean, my grandmother, whatever little jewelry she had, she sewed into uh, my grandfather's socks and stuffed them into his flying boots. Uh, wow. So he was a pilot with which, which is now British Airways, but at that point of time was BOAC, you know, but based out of um, Karachi. They met when they were in, my grandmother was in Kenya, so she was Punjabi, but never born in India, born in Kenya. My grandfather was in, and they met in the, Uni in the you know, United Kingdom. Uh, but settled in um, Karachi and, uh, you know, and, and left it there thinking that at some point of time they'll come back to the home and, you know, that's where she'll find it. Obviously, they never went back. But they were a family of nine children and uh, the parents who moved and stayed in a one little room, uh, you know, apartment or whatever in Delhi at that point of time. And uh, my father, at a very young age, joined the Indian Air Force. He was at the NDA, um, you know, and then became... Um, an Air Force pilot, flew helicopters all his life. At the age of 41, had his first heart attack and was grounded for life. So all the man really knew how to do was to fly and didn't really have, I mean, because he was an NDA product, he didn't really go to university or college or anything. So had no you know, educational qualifications apart from being a man who had fought three wars you know, for his country in 65, 69, and 71, um, you know, highly decorated, all of that, but then found himself with three kids, the youngest being three years old, uh, with no job, uh, grounded for life, didn't want to stay in the Air Force because he knew that it would kill him if he sat at a desk and he wasn't able to fly. And uh, we moved at that point of time, we were based in the Hinden Air Force Station, which is just outside of Delhi, and uh, 1981. And we moved to Bangalore, which was at that point of time, retirement paradise, right. you know. Uh, but it was also a city that was kind of growing and, you know, emerging. And my grandparents used to live there, my mother's parents. Uh, they're of mixed, I mean, they're not Indian, they're, but also mixed heritage. My grandmother's half German, half British. My grandfather's half Swedish, half Scottish. Um, when the partition and when, when the British left India, they decided and chose to give up their British passports and adopt Indian passports and continue to live in India. So my father, in all intents and purposes, married the Gorame himself, basically. <laughs> uh, but yes, yeah, so we moved to Bangalore in 1981. I was three years old and my dad had no job. Uh, you know, and so life was pretty hard, pretty difficult, pretty tough. I have three old, I have two older sisters, so they're three of us. We're ten and six years apart from each other, and uh, you know, we kind of grew up in an environment where I wouldn't say. I mean, I'm not going to make it a sob story and say life is tough because it wasn't. In comparison to what I see today, it wasn't tough, but it was challenging. Yes. And my dad got very lucky, you know, he kind of after about two or three years uh, was offered a, a, a job opportunity with Hindustan Aeronautics. So he got back doing what he did, which was aviation, but at least outside of the uh, Air Force. But my dad was 60 years old by the time he finally was able to put down a brick in the soil and have a permanent address that he called home. Wow. So 60 years old. You know, so for the longest time ever, almost all his life, the man always had either an Air Force address or an address from a company that provided him accommodation. So for him, for somebody who is, and you will understand this if you live through that partition, that at the age of 60 to finally have some place that you call home was, uh, was massive. 
But in the meantime, it gave us an opportunity where we traveled around so much that as kids growing up, you had, um, I today look at it as a pro because I mean, we, look, we traveled constantly. We were adapting to absolutely new states, new cultures, new friends, new schools, uh, you know, constantly. And uh, when people ask us what gives service kids a little bit of an edge over other mm -hmm. civilian kids, I think that is what it is. It's the fact and the, and the aspect that you travel around so much constantly that you're constantly adapting, you know, you're constantly finding ways to connect to people, make new friends, you know, do all of that. Uh, so 16 years old in Bangalore, uh, in my 11th standard, my sister apparently saw an ad in a newspaper for the Glad Rags Supermodel Contest, took the most horrific <laughs> photographs of me. I wasn't even 16 then, I was 15 at that point of time. Sent them in to Maureen Wadia in Bombay. And I still remember, it was summer vacation, I was sitting at home, my mother gets a phone call, and she says, oh, we know we're calling from the Glad Rags organization, and Lara's been selected for the Bangalore finals, or I don't know what. And, you know, we, and my mother was like, what? Who's this? You know, so... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and all I heard was that the contest was going to be held in Bombay. I had never been to Bombay in my life. So I pleaded and cried, please, mama, if nothing else, I just want to go. It's a holiday. They're taking me for two weeks. It's going to be an all paid vacation. I want to go. And that's where it actually started up from. So I went into the Bangalore, you know, selections, blah, blah, blah. I got short selected to come for the finals into Mumbai. Won that. I was 16. Uh, I was going into my 12th grade. My mother almost had a heart attack. So she was like, come what may, you are sitting for 12 board exams, which I did. Um, and then finally, when I, when, I when I finished my 12th, I moved and I came to Mumbai and I did my degree and things like that. But I think for me, Brian, more than anything else, it kind of created a hunger. You know, it created, I wanted to do something that made more than anybody else, my dad really proud. You know, because I could see that at that point of time in his life, there was so much that was taken away from him. I have to interject. Yeah. I can so clearly remember the evening you won the Miss India I speak about. And like I said earlier, I happened to be around. I was privileged. Yes. And I can, I think I can say I can still visualize your dad standing outside, <laughs> uh, was it the green room or, or whatever, yeah. waiting for you to come out. Yeah. And I was with someone from the Times and they told me that's Lara's father. Mm -hmm. And I can remember looking at him and I'm telling you, you talk about a chest swell, you talk about eyes, yeah. you know, that, you know, the, he was so proud. Yes. And, and now I understand, you know, a lot more sure. about where that pride yeah. came from and why yeah. that pride came. And more power to you, but he was, and we had a brief chat with him. He did. And uh, I won Miss Universe on the 12th of May. It was his 60th birthday. Oh, was it? <laughs> what a gift. Yep. <laughs> oh, man. This is a crazy story. Crazy. crazy, happy story. Great. So, these two champions meet under crazy circumstances. Debatable. Sparks not debatable. Fly. They still do. Sparks fly. They still... <laughs> oh, yeah. Well said. And then there is beautiful Syrah. Yes. I want to spend a little time talking about her because... While you see Steely Dan there, this Steely personality. Every time I've seen Mayesh with Saira, you're a softy, man. You're a <laughs> softy, Mayesh. Uh, and so are you. Tell us about, tell us about Saira, the effect she's had, the beautiful effect she's had on your lives. It's pretty evident, but say it out. Uh, it's tough to explain. I guess you're a parent. Uh, for me, I always wanted a daughter. So that was the debate we used to have when she was pregnant. No, it was no debate. <laughs> I, you know something, talk about pressure. <laughs> I hadn't, he hadn't even proposed, we weren't even married. We're going to have a child. Uh. <laughs> you know, it's going to be a girl. Why is it going to be a girl? Because it's easier to make a women's singles champion in this country <laughs> than it is to make a men's singles champion. That's why we're going to have a girl. You all were hoping to spend a, a quiet, happy evening after this chat? <laughs> just asking, just so, asking. like, no pressure on the wife. We're going to have a child. It's going to be a girl and she's going to be a singles champion. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and she came pretty quick, actually. So, Hesh and I were married in 2011, February. And Sarah was born in January of 2012. So we were, we, 
honestly didn't even get the opportunity like to you know like slide into the marriage yeah. get used to being this happily married couple right. and we were like mom and dad in one year <laughs> so well that's a happy that's a happy place to be i mean and, and like i said earlier you know i've been privileged enough to hang around you guys and uh, when sarah's around man never a dull moment never a dull moment never a lack of a smile on your faces you know i mean it's yeah. beautiful it really is beautiful she started playing tennis sai here yeah I so mean. the vision so the vision and the intent is falling into place by Mahesh. default default she's yeah. playing tennis by default <laughs> so question lara when is she going to win the miss universe just asking listen she's more ready to win miss universe than she is to win a grand slam okay so her default setting unfortunately it lies entirely on the mother's side it's the mother who's pushing her on to the tennis court <laughs> ciao to which the Get father off. said no i quickly realized after a few months that you know <laughs> the amount of torture that it takes for the kid to become a tennis player is something that i did not really know if i wanted to deal with because it is actually painful and for me to push her to that amount of pain but everyone around us feels to think that it would be worth it over the long run so i'm trying to deal with it so far and she's only 7 so we'll take it year by year and see how it goes <laughs> what you determined as a kid to achieve did you have or, or, i've met a lot of people who have become great achievers mahesh but they've not kind of you know aspired or dreamt early in life to be what they have become they've just followed life the passionate people they've followed life they've kind of created the journey on the go what was it in your case were you predetermined i mean i know you mentioned your father put you into tennis but did you have aspirations to the level you've i don't think so i mean at a certain age this you can't predetermine anything like this right i mean you kind of go with the flow and like i said when i went to wimbledon the dream was to play there one day but uh you know when i played my junior wimbledon there when i was 17 was itself a very exciting moment parents flew in from uh, to london just to watch that so i felt like you know that dream was achieved and then um, i wasn't very good as a junior either so i was shipped off to college okay you know all my friends who uh you know the rule of thumb is if you're not good enough to go professional you use your tennis to get a great scholarship in a university in the US study and then you know get into the business world so that was the plan i guess i wasn't a very good junior but the two years that i was there like i said i was thriving in a team atmosphere so i really improved very quickly and then all of a sudden you know the coach and my results and then i i had to leave college and turn pro but um yeah i mean i think once i was in college then there was some realization because people were telling me listen you know the level is got to a stage where you should really give it a shot so i left college after 2 years and then went pro i'm going to kind of further my question around that same vibe you know there are tons and tons of us there was a time when careers were pretty predetermined and you had to fall into one of those 3 or 4 or 5 slots or else you were considered you know i won't say a loser but you know not mainstream success things have changed today yeah. right i mean i think there are mul- a multiplicity <clears throat> of you know career options but i want to ask you mahesh what do you what would be your general bit of advice to to young men young ladies as well who want to pursue you know life's passions as careers what does it take looking back i think passion is key right i mean and 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 we constantly know saira comes home one day and she wants to dance then you know one day she you know spends a couple of days with clarabel and she says you know i want to uh, start my own salon i mean we <laughs> as long as she's passionate about what she does and enjoys True. it i think that's key today because uh, otherwise you know going through life grinding it out and slogging it like we did i think we've done the hard work now if she's passionate about it i think we'll be able to support it and y'all are good with that y'all are good with her following a passion even even if it doesn't fall into one of the prescribed of slots that's of great of course yes that's great sure. what's your take lara not just on sara but what's your take on or what's your bit of advice to you know brian i think for me being a mom now to even just a 7 year old i see the amount i mean i have uh, we're all girls in the family right my sisters both have girls and uh, they the eldest is 27 my niece the eldest niece is 27 and then 21 and 15 
And there's so much pressure on kids today, and it's absolutely frightening to see the amount of children that are suffering from anxiety, from depression, uh, just based on performance and academic performance, right? And especially with the fact that the you know that today social media is you know a plus and I think more a minus, especially for teenagers. And there's so much, there's no concept of self-worth. Your concept of self-worth is based today on how many likes you have or the comments that people, anonymous people are passing on, you know, whatever your Facebook account or your Instagram account or your Twitter account or whatever it is. And um, I find that it's an increasingly, unfortunately, negative space that kids are occupying. So to be very honest, I don't think any child needs any more pressure from family members or anybody else, whether it's the academic school or any of that, to kind of conform to a role that we expect them to play. I think children really honestly need to be encouraged to follow exactly what their passions are, to whatever it is. I honestly don't care if Saira wants to be you know, uh, a BMC sweeper. I genuinely, honestly do not care. I do not look down upon it. I just feel that it has to be something that this child, because tomorrow she might feel that she's contributing to society, you know, that she's doing something, it's conscious living for her. And uh, I think you need to really encourage that with kids. So as much as I think it's nice for her to play a sport, because I would like her to be physically active, and I want her to learn a few things when it comes to the discipline of playing any sport. It's in her genes to play tennis. I mean, today she's got the Bhupati backhand. You can see it very clearly. You know, so it's there. And it gives her a chance to bond with her dad on court for an hour, you know, a couple of times a week. That's priceless. You know, it's priceless. So at this point of time, if that's something that she really wants to do, but the day she starts fighting and pushing back, I don't think we're going to be the kind of parents that are going to say, no, you know, this is what you have to do and we don't care and this is what we want you to do. And of course, it's difficult with sport, and I've seen it with Hesh and his family, that when you're a child, nobody wants to wake up, nobody wants to miss a birthday party because you need to go to tennis and play, spend two hours over there. You know, you, don't, you want to stay back with your friends, you want to have a play date. So yes, it's a fine line to walk and balance to have until the child is old enough to decide for themselves whether this is something they want to do or not. But as a parent, that's a learning process every single day. You need to know when you're being proactive, and you're really encouraging them to play, and when you're just pushing against, you know, the instinctive grain of a child, something that they really don't want to do. You know, Saira is blessed, man, to have a dad and a mom who, who think like y'all. Really, really wonderful. Because I think often parents do it all wrong. Often. And, and it's really great to hear that. Okay, we're going to lighten up the conversation just a little bit, right? Married nine years? Nine years, didn't you say? Yeah. Soon. Do, you believe, do you believe you'll know each other well enough? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> that was very decisive. Yeah, he should be a politician. I've been telling him this for the longest time ever. <laughs> okay. Just saving his ass. Yeah, 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 so yeah, am yeah, I allowed to say that? No, you're well, allowed yeah. to say that. You're allowed to say What was that again? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to kind of test you guys. See, how much do you know about this beautiful oh lady? Oh. And uh, then I'm going to come to you, Lara. So this is for you, Mahesh. Mm. Listen, you haven't connived and compared notes, right? What notes? About each other's likes and dislikes. <laughs> well, over the last nine years, we've tried. <laughs> <laughs> when I was trying to get some information about you, Lara, just to let you know, yeah. I told you backstage, he said, uh, it's not going to work for our marriage. Whose side are you on? <laughs> Uh, but that having been said, I persisted. So, so Hesh, mm. what do you believe is Lara's favorite book? Book? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she reads a book a week. <laughs> no, no favorite book? Oh. No? No favorite book. So, yeah. Pass. You're pass. Yeah, you, you get minus, huh? You get minus. <laughs> okay. We won't count the points because... Uh, I feel for you. I'm as bad as you are. Ask okay. me. He's read only two books in his life. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to come to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What's her favorite vacation spot? Uh, it's Maldives. Oh, uh, bang on, bang on, <laughs> bang on. Fantastic. It is the Maldives. So, you scored. Uh, favorite fictional character? Fictional character. Marvelous Pass. Mrs. Maisel. What? <laughs> 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 No, you got that wrong. Scarlet O'Hara, so you're still on one point. Who's that? Favorite way to spend a holiday? 
holiday. Yeah, her favorite oh. way to spend a holiday. Oh, it depends on where we are. If we're in a touristy spot, she likes to walk around oh, and visit man. places. Otherwise, she likes to eat. <laughs> so, <laughs> depends on where we are. Yeah, no. I think you got that right. Yeah. So, a couple of points. Yeah. Like eat or walk <laughs> no, around? No, no, no. Well, so, eat, yes. <laughs> but exploring the city on foot is what yeah. we got from you. And I think he pretty much said that. So, yeah, that's only because I subjected it to him. Subjected him to it this summer. Mahesh has never, he said he's never walked or run so much on court as much as he did on foot through Italy and Croatia. I played the yeah. Italian Open 18 times and this was the first year I saw the, the, city. Oh, the, the Coliseum and <laughs> everything Corner else. to corner. Yeah. yeah, no, I can imagine. Okay, favorite sports person. Her favorite sports person. You know this. Is Pete Sampras? No, no. little more, newer. Newer? Yeah. Or, she didn't know what sport was till she met me, by the way. So how can it be new? <laughs> this is true. Making I it just up. followed different sport <laughs> okay, than tennis. Roger Federer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So do we give him a mark for that? I <laughs> yeah, mean, yeah. yeah. He knows this also. Okay. I think okay, that's so because I've taken her to watch him play. Well times. done. Well done. Incidentally, he's one of my favorite <laughs> yeah. sportsmen as well. One of my favorite people, actually. Yeah. Fantastic person. Never had the privilege of watching him play live. But anyway. Oh, actually, I did. He was, he was here for the IPTL, yeah, right? Yeah, in Delhi. I did. Yeah, I changed that. I did. Uh, favorite, uh, her favorite woman icon? Uh, Christian Amon. Yes. So I what's think that was the points? answer at the Miss Universe so that everyone knows. Oh, I didn't know it. <laughs> yeah. Right? I was too busy with the voice. Oh, yeah, not bad, not bad, Ash. Four points? Yeah. He's listening at home. I'm uh, glad to hear at least something. Your turn, your turn, your turn, mm -hmm. Lara. About Mahesh. Okay. Uh, his favorite musician or band? Band? I yeah. don't know. Like, I don't. I think with him, I don't. Know. Hindi, Bad Hindi boy, Hindi bad or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be some really. No, I'll, I'll, that's the second. That's second question. That's his favorite okay. song. His favorite band. You're in trouble, lady. His favorite band is band or singer. Yeah, old rock. Yeah, he's prompting. Mm -hmm. Come on. Then. What Beatles? Like a I good husband. Know. No. No, so that, that's it, that's it, no points. Okay, yeah. Def Leppard. Because I'm never what? allowed to play yes. that in the house also. <laughs> <laughs> I have never heard him here freaking Def Leppard in because, my life. Because he says you don't allow him to play his music in the house. <laughs> Please. Family problems besides knowing each other. Okay, favorite song? Has to be, I don't know, some Govinda song. Any song of Govinda has to be his favorite right. song. I've got to give her the points for yeah. <laughs> I got to give her the points what for it. What is it? Mai to raste se ja raha hai. Not bad. Yeah. I'm tempted to give her two points for that. <laughs> not bad, not bad. I never thought you'd get that. Okay. Uh, his favorite dessert. Oh, so let's say his favorite breakfast first. His favorite breakfast is yeah. Eggs Benedict, hands down. Oh, absolutely. Okay, and favorite uh, dessert? Dessert? He doesn't like Indian. Anything, anything that has chocolate in it. I've actually got... Anything chocolate written on Is my cue sheet. Yeah. So, you know what, what he does, right? So, somebody asked us this question a couple of weeks ago when we were doing one of uh, a chat. Uh, what does Mahesh do when he gets really depressed or he loses a match and it's a big thing? You know what he does, right? And I know it immediately. And I'm like, oh my God, even if I'm not with him, like I know. So, he raids the first, like whatever, Starbucks, whatever comes across his road, and he picks up like every single chocolate chip cookie that there is in the store. And if there are no chocolate chip cookies, then it's as many chocolate bars as and then he locks himself in his room and he eats like 20 cookies or like Where does he hide it? Where does bars. he hide it? I mean it's ridiculous. And unfortunately he's passed that on to his daughter as well. Is that right? <laughs> oh God. Yeah. You stand accused, young man. <laughs> you stand accused. But great, great. I mean, you got both of that right. So what, three points already? I See? think I've stopped counting. Do I have like you. a hamper? Is this like a like a coffee no, with current thing? If, if, no? if you get See? more points than him, you it's get to take juice. him home tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's Yay! <laughs> <laughs> okay, his favorite TV show of all time. Friends. Can hey. I tell a funny story? Yes, here? please, yes, please. I left my daughter with my husband for the first time ever. We were in the UK. I decided to go on a girl's holiday. I said, Mahesh, will you watch our daughter? He said very happily, yes, of course. So I left my neighbor in charge. I said, between the two of them, please make sure one has a bath at least every day and it should be my child. <laughs> and then I left and I went on holiday and I came back. And of course, Saira was thrilled to see mother and whatever. And she said, Mama, we sat on the couch and we watched Friends every day. Right? And she was five years old. 
<laughs> Cut two. We come back to Bombay. He's flown off from London, coming back. We've come back to Bombay. I'm unpacking suitcases. Saira's playing in her room next door. Her cousins come to visit. They're playing tent, tent. <laughs> and Saira's conversation is, okay now, this is my house and this is your house. And I'm divorced. So I... I <laughs> One minute, come here. What did you say? I'm divorced, mama. Saira? What is the meaning of divorced? What are you playing? What is the meaning of divorced? It's when two people are in a bad marriage and are not getting along and decide to live separately. Who told you this? Daddy! <laughs> well, guess what, Sarah? Daddy and me are about to get divorced. <laughs> Daddy is called up. Daddy is in Dubai. Daddy is called up. Why did you tell your five-year-old about divorce? And he starts laughing on the other end of the line. I'm like, why is this funny? I don't find anything funny in it. And he says, oh, we were watching Friends and she wanted to know why is Ross married three times? <laughs> so father decided to give her the very specific translation or whatever definition of divorce <laughs> to a five-year-old. If anyone's wondering about what oh a happy marriage God. constitutes, this is it. <laughs> yeah, you must agree to agree, you must agree to disagree, you must disagree to agree, whatever floats your boat. I think I know what the tenor is, Rhea. <laughs> I was going to ask you the next question, it just doesn't make sense. See? Don't even bother to answer yeah. it because you already have. I was going to ask you, favorite father-daughter activity. <laughs> 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 okay, so she scores brownies, she scores brownies on that. Listen, I don't know if this is going to put a smile on your face or otherwise. I think she's got the prize and she's <laughs> taking you home tonight, Mahesh. Okay, I might as well go through this. Favorite childhood memory. His favorite childhood memory? Yeah. I don't know, this is a story his sister told me that once apparently his parents took him on mm -hmm. uh, a holiday. I think it was like to, I don't know, Hawaii or Tahiti or I don't know where, whatever. <laughs> and then he went missing the whole afternoon and his mother was going crazy and went running around looking for him all over in this hotel and they couldn't find him. I think he was like 11 years old or whatever. And basically he had slunk off to go to the only nude beach that there was in wherever this place was. And I'm putting it down to his favorite childhood memory. That's it. <laughs> he lied to us and said going to Wimbledon at age 30. <laughs> he lied to us, Lara. So I'm tempted actually to give her the points for this because you lied to Where us. Where was yeah. it? Tahiti. I was Tahiti, see? <laughs> Listen, we've got to meet after this show. <laughs> So I think, Mahesh, I don't know what you were planning on doing later tonight. Sounds like this is fixed. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like this is fixed. Okay, we, you know, it's been great chatting. I mean, and this, Tell Us Like It Is, is, a, is an episode on which we hope to learn, get to know the people behind the personality. And my goodness, has today been, uh, been a fantastic episode or what? Thank you. You guys are the shiniest, happiest couple, man. And... I just wish we could have ended the show with Saira creeping up on you guys, you know, and having us get a complete picture of friends but, or family as the case is, but that's unfortunately not possible. But more power to you guys for who you all are, for who you all have become as a family, for that beautiful young lady in your lives. Thank you for actually taking time out to join us on Tell Us Like It Is. The whole vibe is... Uh, to talk to shiny, happy people, like I said, and you certainly fit that slot. I'm going to end on a slightly serious note, guys, but a happy note. You know, I always say this, and sometimes I get shot for saying it, but in today's world, we live in a really sensational, negativity-filled world, and it tires me very often. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons for Tell Us Like It Is is to you know, to actually try and in a small way change that in whatever way we can as individuals, as a collective. I'm sure both of you actually have something that you'll feel fiercely passionate about. It doesn't have to be a change the world kind of thing. But um, every one of us actually has one or two things that we feel really fiercely about. And if we had an opportunity to do it, we'd have, you know, gotten it done. I'm going to have or request each of you to kind of share with our audiences the one thing that, a message if you want, that you want to put out, that you feel really passionate about. Hesh, I'm going to start with you. Well, there's so much uh, to be done in our country. I think uh, if anything was to stand out, uh, 
I mean, we obviously continue to get uh, requested to support as much as we possibly can. But, uh, you know, for me, ever since Saira was born, obviously <coughs> the emotional connect with uh, having a daughter and the challenges that face the girl child in our country every day, I kind of made a conscious effort to support that. Uh, I support it in various ways, uh, part of it through that Nanni Kali that, right. you know, Anand Mahindra runs with Atul. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know. So the girl child, yeah. the, you know, the respect that uh, we... That's, that the, I think that's, that would be the main one. I mean, I think there's a lot of other stuff that we do, which is probably not as focused. No, you're absolutely right. In this country, that really is one of the primary concerns or, or you know, areas that we really need to work on and seemingly way, way more difficult than, yeah. than we think it is. Because yeah, I mean, it's there so are a lot of horror stories that, you know, I I know. Mean, we, we live, I think, uh, a bit of, in a bubble when in the major cities in India. I mean, the stories that you read about and hear, uh, you know, from tier two, tier three in rural India, are horrifying. Uh, and obviously we all wish that we could change as much as we possibly can, but I think, you know, as much as we can do, we can do. Yeah, no, well said, Lara, you? So I think, Brian, that both Mahesh and I are united on that. Um, I think one of the greatest blessings in my life was in 2000, right after I won Miss Universe, that I was asked and approached by the United Nations to be a UN Goodwill <coughs> Ambassador to specifically the United Nations Population Fund. And we worked on women's reproductive rights issues and gender discrimination, which was at that point of time huge. I mean, the difference between the girl and, girl and boy ratio within this country at that point of time was one of the massivest. Uh, differences across the world. And uh, I had the extreme privilege of working on immense amounts of campaigns at grassroots level, uh, was part of the team that worked also, you know, behind the scenes to get the PCP and DT Act passed, which prohibits the deter sex determination right. of the fetus in India. And uh, over these last couple of years, so that's something that I've always been very, very actively involved in. And I think for me, it's a tremendous responsibility that I, that is almost sacred to me to be the face and the voice of millions of faceless women that don't have a voice in this country. And I take that job very, very seriously. And in this last year, even being part of the industry that I'm part of, there have been the most, in the last 18 months, there have been the most incredible conversations that have started up, conversations on, uh, you know, on pay parity, on uh, inclusivity, on, um, you know, on the Me Too campaign. And it's not easy because I belong to an industry that's extremely male dominated. So sometimes when you raise your voice, whether it is within the industry or within the media, uh, it's very often silenced or you're ostracized for it. Uh, but at the same time that I think that today I'm in a position, um, I'm at a stage in my career where I honestly don't have that much to lose. And therefore to find that voice, it takes an immense amount of courage to honestly do it, but it has to be done. And I've always been a woman's woman all my life. Um, you know, I come from a family where my grandmother is one of six, my mother is one of three, we're one of three, all my sisters, including me, we have girls. So I almost feel that in this lifetime, it is, uh, it's my onus, it, it lays upon me to really, and, and on my family, to really, you know, kind of raise up this army of these amazing Amazonian achieving women, and we're all, they're all the girls in my family, almost six feet tall. But that said and done, I think uh, it's very, very important. I feel for the longest time, women have been, we've been our own worst enemies. And that's also because the opportunities were so few. So women fought like cats and dogs, you know, and pushed each other aside and, you know, kind of really uh, pitched each other out, if I can say, because those opportunities were so few that you wanted to grab them. Yeah, the bucket of crabs. You know, syndrome, exactly. Yeah. But so today, but if there is, if women stand together and there's an opportunity for that voice that's already started and is growing to get so much louder and for women to support each other, you end up creating more opportunities, you know, where at the end of the day, then you don't have to fight. You know, and I've always said it much to my husband's dismay, dismay that, you know, women are constantly fighting for equality but I honestly feel if we're fighting for equality, we're actually demoting ourselves because I genuinely feel that women are superior to men. <laughs> so there's no point fighting for equality. You're coming down, you know. <laughs> and we got some concurrence in the audience. My you and me need to spend a lot more time than I thought we needed to together. But, you know, on a, on a, on a more serious note, I did say at the top of this episode 
that I was privileged this evening and as viewers, both live and recorded, you know, we are privileged to have been part of this conversation with two beautiful people. Along their journey, they've achieved what we, what we know and what we've heard of today. But I repeat, two beautiful people who are on a mission that's gonna make a difference. I just honestly, from the heart, wanna thank you two guys yet again. Thank you. For taking time out, you know, and, and being on this episode. Uh, more power to, to you guys and all y'all do. Thanks. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you.